episode 148 above ground podcast the warrior's code with frank the legend shamrock disclaimer the host of this podcast timothy patrick and will foley are by no means medical professionals however having lived experience with mental illness themselves they have gained useful perspectives on common mental health issues that some of us struggle to overcome on a daily basis by sharing their stories they hope to create connection By creating connection, they hope to help you find your purpose. And through purpose, we can all begin to build the foundation for positive mental health. This is Above Ground Podcast. Are you ready to lace up your boots, throw up your horns, and jump into the pit? Then let's stomp the stigmas of mental illness. It's time for Above Ground Podcast. Now, Will Foley and Timothy Patrick. Hey, what is up, everyone? Welcome to Above Ground Podcast. Above Ground Podcast, because you can't serve below. You know who that is. That's TPP. You down with TPP? Yeah, you know me. Ah, Timmy, what's up, buddy? How are you doing today, man? Doing fairly well. Doing fairly well. A little anxious, but doing fairly well. How are Uh, you doing? Dude, I am stoked. I am stoked. We might as well just get right to it, because we are joined today by the legend, Uh, He is an entrepreneur. He is a UFC and mixed martial arts legend. He is also an awesome dude to listen to about mental training and, and mindset. We are joined today by Frank, the legend Shamrock. Holy shit. I can't believe we're sitting here (laughs) talking to you, man. This is awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, man. How are you? How you doing? I'm doing good, man. It's been a great holiday season and, you know, the sun just sort of popped out here in California. You know, we had our two week winter of rain, which was really nice. So yeah, life is good. Awesome, man. What do you, what do you think of when you think of the rain and see the rain? Um, I love it. I mean, I just, I, you know, we don't get enough of it here and it's not as green as I want it to be. So um, I, I genuinely love the rain. And then as a film producer, I also see the sadness and value of rain because <laughs> I'm always like, oh, we need rain right here. This would really, <laughs> this <would> really bring <laughs> this down. Dude, as a, as a producer and songwriter, like the rain yeah. is such a good, such a good sound sound just to key. have in your rain is awesome. So it is great to have you. Um, Tim and I really just kind of want to jump into stuff, man, because yeah. we, uh, this is a mental health podcast, so we're not really going to cover too much of of what everybody knows about you, which is your your background in MMA and being the what I saw in your documentary, being the real first true MMA fighter, being that well rounded in all of your skills when because of how you were taught and stuff. I, I really want to start by kind of going through your journey and how you are now and, and where you've come from and what you've come through in, in like a short little synopsis for people who don't know who you are. Sure. Well, um, I, uh, I grew up like, uh, I think I thought I grew up as a normal kid in, um, you know, central Northern California, which is much greener than where I live near Los Angeles. Um, and, uh, my mom was a single mom, so she had four kids. Dad left when, when I was a baby. Um, so I just remember growing up, you know, on welfare, being like a normal kind of low income kid. And then um, started having all these emotional issues when I entered school. And that was really, you know, the beginning of sort of my emotional, uh, <laughs> mental awareness journey. Um, and I just had all these overwhelming emotions and I couldn't fit into any any social situations. I started seeing all these therapists and and sort of had a, uh, began a life of sort of exploration to figure out what was going on with Frank. Um, And then when I was 10, I threw rocks at a train and that is a felony in the state of California. So I was arrested and sent to juvenile hall. And that was the very first time I'd been out of my home. I was very, you know, closed home, closed community. And, um, you know, I was just talking to other kids about what's going on with me and life. And, you know, your kids, you talk, communicate about things. And it was the very first time I communicated to anybody about uh, what was happening to me physically and the abuses and like 
I don't even know their abuses. I thought they were perfectly normal. Um, you know, being locked in a closet, living in the backyard, like living in the tool shed, like all these different, like, you know, social things that were happening to me, which, I, you know, I just thought were perfectly normal. And when I asked about what was going on and how they were dealing with these things, um, you know, I started realizing and being told that this stuff wasn't normal. It wasn't happening to everybody else. And that's what kind of woke me up. And I was like, oh, wow, something, something really bad is happening here. I didn't really know how to deal with it or get out of it because it was my home. You know, I was raised there. Um, and so, you know, I just realized the crime got me out of my home to do this time in juvenile hall. <laughs> I went and saw my counselors. I kind of told them what was going on. And, you know, they really reconfirmed, hey, if you keep doing this stuff, they're going to take you out of your home. So I um, just went full into crime until they took me out of my home. I became a ward of the state when I was 11. And then I started going through the uh, state system of, um, you know, they parent you and you go from foster home to group home. And, um, but crime became my tool, my addiction, if you will, to sort of change the situation so that I could deal with things because that's the only thing I knew that had worked for me. And that worked great until I ended up in prison. And then I went to prison when I was uh, 17, 18. Um, and, um, but when I turned 12, I had met uh, 12, almost 13. One of my group home dads was a guy named Bob Shamrock who ran the Shamrock Boys Ranch. And he had a whole different approach to how, you know, dealing with kids and he really got it on both how to be a dad, how to be a community leader and how to be a family leader. Uh, he really got it. And so it was just a great wake up call for me as a troubled, you know, emotionally traumatized person to meet somebody like that. Um, and I just fell in love with him because I never really had a dad and my dad's had all kinds of issues and mental health issues and strings attached. And, but he was just very pure with his love and guidance. And, um, you know, he taught me how to be a man. He gave me his principles. He showed me how to, you know, run a family. He showed me, you know, how things work. I screwed it up, of course, kept going, ended up in prison. Uh, but he stayed with me as a mentor, kept guiding me. And then when I was in prison, this sport started, mixed martial arts, ultimate fighting. At the time was called no holds barred um, or no rules fighting. And, um, and I just saw it as my chance. You know, it was always my dream to be a champion. It was always my dream to be an athlete. I was very athletic. I was very gifted. Um, and with Bob's guidance, you know, I got out of prison. I was out of prison for two days. And then I went to the martial arts school. And then I never left for 16 years till I'd beaten everyone, figured it out, <laughs> conquered all things. And, and then, um, then I went to the next phase of my life, which is, you know, sort of where I'm at now. Wow. That, that is your story is one of, of, <laughs> it's wild. of, dude, it's wild, but it's like when I watched your documentary, I, I actually kind of fanboyed out this morning and watched like a bunch oh, of nice. your fights, a bunch of your fights and, and stuff on YouTube. And, uh, I was super like, just like hearing your story and seeing how you fought in the cage back in the day and, and seeing how you are now and what you've become and what you've made of yourself is incredible because you're not, you're not any, are, now are you still involved? You still run? Do you run training still? No, no. I have no involvement in the physical side of it. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's, it's incredible that you've been able to reinvent yourself over and over and over again. And you found that reinvention was your way of survival because growing up and, and being in survival mode, you discovered that even though crime is a negative, it was a positive for you to get you to the next level. And that takes, that takes a lot of self self-reflection, even at your young age. I, I'm really curious about how did, what was the feeling like realizing that you were in trouble at that time? Do you remember, can you reflect back on that first time when you heard from kids that your growing up was not normal? Yeah, I just, you know, for years we were trying to figure out what was wrong with Frank. And, and so I thought something was wrong with Frank. I was like, obviously there's something wrong with me. I got, I, mean, I, I have all these social problems and interactive problems and anger issues. And, and so there was obviously something wrong with Frank. Um, but when you're a kid, you always feel like there's something wrong with you anyways. And there's always, cause you're trying to figure out the world. So it seemed perfectly normal that there was something really wrong with Frank. <laughs> so I didn't, it was just a wake up call. I was like, Oh my God, what do you mean? And they're like, no, like you can't do that. That's not how it works. And I was like, no, no, that's what's going on. Like, that's, that's how it works in my house. And, and it was just this realization, like just awareness, like, Oh my God, like there's something wrong. 
And maybe it's not me. Maybe it's not me because I, I was earnestly looking for it too. Like I was like, why can't I, how come I can't act like normal kids? Like what's wrong with me? What's wrong with my, you know, my emotional status that I can't figure this stuff out when everybody else could and they could do it just fine. Uh, but I, for some reason could. So yeah, it was just a real awareness. Like, like, Oh, <laughs> darn it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think some of that um, was other people's like opinions and stuff that were thrown onto you and kind of maybe stuck, you know, when you, when you would, you know, it's, it's good that you question yourself, but to like, you know, consume it, everything and, and, and basically say, you know, well, yeah, it's, it's obviously all me or, you know, I'm doing this or I can't do what other kids do. So it's all me. But do you think some of that was also other people's, you know, opinions and, and, you know, views of, of Frank? Oh yeah, Totally. Well, I don't think anyone knew what was going on and everyone was trying to figure it out. What was going on is I was being psychologically and physically abused. And that was the, that, you know, that was the, the facts of the matter. And those were the reasons why I was having all these issues, but nobody knew those things were going on until those kids told me that that was, cause I never, no one ever asked, you know, this is the eighties. So we never, you know, we didn't know about stuff like that and we didn't ask, we didn't think. So the teachers are trying to figure it out. The counselors are trying to figure it out. The police are trying to figure it out. Um, and it came down to me to make the decision. I was like, well, okay, well, well, crime works. You know, I'll just do the crime. It didn't hurt. Like I didn't get hurt, you know, like it wasn't, you know, scary, but living in the tool shed is scary. Living in the backyard is scary when you're a kid, like things like that, you know, they're, you know, I lived on the streets. I lived in the park because it was, I felt safer. I felt less scared. I felt less traumatized. And, you know, once you, once you start doing that, then you're in juvenile hall. It's not that scary. It's, it's quite nice. Like I liked juvenile hall. So <laughs> it became, I thought it was a perfect system. I would hang out with my friends. You know, they'd send me to a new group. I'd hang out with them. I'd be like, yeah, it's not, I don't, I don't get it. I'm not, I don't fit in. I'd be like, oh, I know how to get out. And then I'd go, <laughs> and I'd go right back to my friends and my counselors and my school teachers. And, I, and so it was not an unpleasant experience. It, I was actually having a great time. <laughs> and, and it's that makes only, sense. It and makes it's, sense. Yeah, and it was my only good life experience. Like the other parts was sucked. My home life sucked. Like everything sucked. So like this was exciting. And then, you know, crime was my drug. Like it was the thing that, you know, fixed my problems. But also, you know, I knew it was wrong. Like I... Yeah. <laughs> Your brain's going, yeah, this is so wrong. <laughs> but it's, you know, that feeling of being in control and of being able to do something and of being, you know, having some type of, you know, con control, I guess it would be. That that meant all the, you know, it meant everything. to me. Yeah, I mean, things, uh, you know, obviously could have gone a completely different direction for you. Um, oh, yeah. Is there any, is there, or I'm sure there's variables and, and multiple things, but is there anything that pops into your head that, you know, that, that you can kind of pinpoint and say, like, if it wasn't for this, or maybe this time or this person that kind of, you know, kept you on the track, so to speak? Um, well, I, <laughs> I did everything bad because I thought, you know, I, I, I had earned it because of the bad things that had happened to me. And then because when you're a kid and bad things happen, it skews your perception of authority and, and everything gets messed up. And so, you know, I literally just did not care. You know, I was, I was just surviving and doing my thing. And, you know, I thought I'd found this secret formula, which was <laughs> commit crime. You know, everything's messed up. Crime fixes it. And the system was safe for me to be it. So I didn't feel anything other than these are my friends. This is great. <laughs> these people are nice. I don't get it. And this religion's new, but I'll study it. And this is cool. And, you know, I'm trying to fit in and ah, forget it. Let's commit a crime and get out. So I, I had really no feeling connected to any of it other than the survival and the learning. And, um, but it was fascinating because I got to learn all these religions and all these different social things and all these different communities and, you know, from someone who didn't get exposed to any of that. And, and I was smart. So I liked learning things. Like to me, I loved learning and exploring. I just didn't get all the other stuff, the emotional stuff and, the, you know, the social rules. And like, what do you mean? I just can't take that. Like, it's, it's, I, I deserve it. You know, bad things have happened to me. So because my brain was messed up, 
I just couldn't figure out how to fit in. And it wasn't until I got to, you know, martial arts and, you know, social development and personal development. And, you know, until Bob's, you know, until I went to prison, I had nothing left. And I was like, wow, okay, now what do I do? Like, wow, I really screwed up. That's when I remembered all the people who did help me. So there were a lot of police officers who were like, listen, bro, we're going to shoot you one day on accident when you're climbing over the fence because you're doing bad things. And it's just, that's what happens. So a lot of people told me, hey, listen, you, you, you're going to, you know, but I didn't hear them and I couldn't really hear them until I sat in prison and then it all lined up and I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, that guy tried to help. And wow, that guy tried to help. Um, one of the things that I, I just take them as lessons, the biggest lessons that I've learned and um, just hundreds of people tried to help me because I could see I was in trouble, like hundreds of kind hearted, like good families, you know, all kinds of people went, wow, man, that, that kid's got some issues. <laughs> let me try to help him a little bit. Like, let me give him a guidance, a hand of anything. And, um, you know, that's what's really affected me and helped me become the person I am. Because in looking back, I now see all those people, the people that did stop, you know, the people that went, whoa, man, like, um, you know, Mrs. Tucker from third grade, who could see I was crazy smart and just messed up. And so even when I went away and had all these issues, like she would just send me schoolwork because she's like, his kid loves to learn and he's a good guy, but he's just so messed up. He can't even get things done. And so she saw that and tried to help. And that to me is, you know, the real connective human love spirit, you know, going on this journey. And if yeah, it's pure, priceless. It's priceless. And if you stay pure and you stay honest and you're just like, hey, this is, this is where we're at and this is what's going on people will stop. They'll help, they'll mentor, they'll guide, or they'll slap you upside the head and go, dude, you're on the wrong track. <laughs> well, reality, little, yeah, yeah, reality will reality slap you in, yeah, yeah, reality will smack you in the face quicker than, you know, <laughs> quicker than you could smack Tito Ortiz. Right. So that's the beauty <laughs> of, of martial arts for me is unlike business. Now I do entrepreneurship. I do leadership. I do all these different things in these different industries. Um, but it comes down to the fundamentals of martial arts. You know, you learn, you practice, you develop. And unlike business and these other things, in martial arts, it's instant. You're like, oh, bang, well, that doesn't work. That totally hurts my face. Um, in parenting and all these other things, it takes so much longer to figure things out and the results of things. Martial arts, it's instant. And that's one of the beauties of it is it helps give you that courage, that confidence, that understanding that, oh, okay, you know, hey, it is what it is. So what do we what do we do about it? We learned that crime doesn't work, so we should try some other you know techniques like martial arts. Um, I I want to touch on that because in your documentary you talk about how your first child was born while you were in prison. Yeah, and and now you have an, another family and stuff. And I, I want to know when was it, and maybe this hasn't happened yet, or maybe it's an ongoing process. When does, when did you stop feeling shame or, or disgust about your, some of your actions? Because it's clear by the way you describe stuff that when we talk about parents who abuse us and whatnot, you don't realize that there's shame and disgust in there because you don't know who to be shamed about and disgusted about. So you turn it inside. Have you worked through all that now, or is this an ongoing process that you'll be on until, until you die? Yeah. I, I never felt shame about it. I just felt overwhelmed with emotion and I didn't understand why. Um, and part of it was, I didn't even know about all the locking in the closets when I was a baby and everything before that. Apparently it had been going on my whole life. <laughs> and I only became conscious of it at a certain time in my life. And, and I never knew any of this until, you know, I was in my mid thirties. I was writing a book about my life and, and I put a picture of me as a young child um, on the cover to help sell the book and bring awareness to it. And my aunt, who married my mom's brother, who I never even knew was in my life, saw this picture and contacted me and said, you know, hey, I've been holding this in for 25 years. I never told anybody, but I found you hanging from the back of your knees when you were two years old in the closet. And I never said anything or did anything. And I just left. 
And I was like, what are you talking about? It's probably 35 or 36 years old. So I knew that I'd been locked in the closet. I knew that bad things had happened, but I didn't know that it had happened since I was a baby. And I didn't know that my mom was sort of the, the nexus of all of this. Wow. That's yeah. Wow. That's a lot and, worse than <laughs> that's a lot terrible. worse than I would have thought even, man. I, it's you know, terrible. yeah, it's, it's terrible. And I, I didn't. So, but, but to your question, like I didn't, I wasn't ashamed of it. I was just ashamed that I had these emotional issues that I couldn't grasp. You know, I felt overly emotional. I felt overly angry. I felt overly, you know, anxious about things. Um, but it was all caused from this trauma that I never knew had happened to me. And then, um, but, you know, once I did find it out, then I did go back and I was like, yo, mom, like, what on earth? Like, what happened here? Um, and, you know, she tried to pass that on, tried to blame, you know, my stepdad. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like, mom. And I told her the story that I just told you. And she was, you know, did not want to communicate about it, did not want to acknowledge it in any way. And when I pressed her, you know, she said, bad things happened to me. That's what happened to me. So that's what happened to you. And that was the end of it. And I was like, well, just, uh, just as a moving forward, this is something I would never do to my child. And I can't imagine ever doing this to my child. And I can't imagine you imagining that. <laughs> no, and I, I can't. And I was like, mom, this really fucked me up for a long, long time. And it's probably gonna take me the rest of my life. But I can't imagine that mom. And that was, you know, and that's, um, that's where it left. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, I got to say, man, Frank, you know, I, I love hearing your story and, and seeing where you are now and seeing that you're on top and, and, and how you've come through all this. And uh, I love the fact that you're vulnerable and you don't shy away from your feelings. It's like the true meaning of warrior for me to see it. It's awesome, dude. I just want to say that. Oh, thanks, bro. Yeah, that it's, it's dude. You are so like it's incredible though, man. The journey that you've been on. I I got to ask you because obviously you've reinvented yourself over and over again, and I I want to know what was it like for you to step away from what you knew, which was crime then into mixed martial arts, but then you step away from mixed martial arts and the thing that built you up to be the champion that you are, but that was in you and then start other things. Like, where did you get that from? Is that just your survival mechanism that you just throw yourself into something completely like that? Or is that something that you developed more and more as you saw results? Yeah. I, I I'd love to call it like this, you know, amazing mindset, but I think I'm like a five-year-old boy and I just keep raising my hand. I'm like, that sounds great. And I go, yeah, I'll do that. And I just sort of jump in there. Um, and I think I have all the same feelings and emotions that everybody else has. And instead of saying, no, I just build around it until we're doing it. Uh, that's kind of how my brain works. It's just extremely mechanical. And what I have to assume is because of all that stuff happened to me, you know, at a key time when probably other emotional things and other things were supposed to be developing, um, the mechanical side of my brain developed better. And so for me, it, it's, you know, I got all these crazy emotions, I can hardly harness them. But on the mechanical side, my brain just builds things as you speak. So if we start talking about something, <laughs> a business or a mechanic or a martial art or something, my brain will start connecting the pieces Literally, as we're talking, I could draw it on a piece of paper in a few minutes. So that's how my brain works. It's totally crazy. But I used that to makes perfect people, sense, actually. Yeah, because when I think of fighting, it's ones and zeros. It's not a bunch of techniques and this and that. And, oh, it's ones and zeros. Like the human body does X. <laughs> These are the mechanics right. that are possible within the human body. And then you apply that to, to the moment. Like that's literally it. But to get that granular and that simple and that thing super hard for people and so that's like my super my, like my secret power um and for me it, it was hard to transition away from fighting just because it was so i was so it was so valuable and passionate to me like it just it, it had it done so much for me and you know i i went from the bottom like i was carrying bags to owning a league and like launching it on networks like i couldn't like I, I couldn't get more out of it 
But when it was over, I was still the same person. I <laughs> still emotionally, you know, had still had the same problems. I just had more resources and access, you know, time. And so, you know, for me, I invested the time because I, you know, I ended that journey. I was like, yeah, I'm the greatest, you know, and then I would sit in the morning and be crying alone, be like, oh, this is not good. Like, what's what's going on? Um, but it's because, you know, while this sport gave me all this stuff and martial arts gave me all this stuff, it was the only identity that I really had. And I had to go find myself, like find out who I really was and what was most important to me. You know, and that's when I made the decision. I was like, yeah, I'm not going to fight anymore. I'm going to stay home with my daughter. Like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to totally change this entire thing because, you know, what I really want to be doing. And now that I have the resources to do it and the emotional and physical stability, I'm not going to die because I always thought I was going to die. There's no way I was going to make this journey. It seemed crazy, you know, and even like really smart people were like, yeah, there's no way you're going to do this. <laughs> yeah. So, and, no, and little did they know, little did they know that you were, you know, that you had heard that your whole entire life. So you were going to prove them wrong. Yeah. So I, I was always having these markers, like, you know, 18 was a big marker, you know, 21 was a big marker. Like, Cause I was like, well, there's no way this, how can this continue? Um, but once I got to that place, you know, my early my mid mid thirties, like a thirty seven, was I retired um, at all time in the world, you know. Then it was just me, and my daughter, and the things I really, really wanted to be doing, like the charity work, the mental health. You know, that was the time where I really figured out like what bipolar was, and I was like, man, we got to help my brother Perry. Like, we got to figure this out. Um, and yes, that's when I started. Yeah, that's when I started figuring out how broken the the mental health system is and how you know, education and knowledge and Medicaid, everything is, you know, antiquated and, and not connected. And so that's how I really got into mental health. Wow. And speaking of your brother, Perry, um, has, is your brother Perry still with us? Has he been able to, to, to get out of the homeless cycle? Is he able to get out of his cycles or is he still in the, no, no, he took his life in jail in 2018. November. Oh my gosh, man. I'm so sorry. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. It was, it was really hard because we, um, you know, I, I learned as much as I could, you know, got as much support as I could. We got the whole family rallied to help him. We got him off the street a whole bunch of times, but you could just see the gradual, you know, him diminishing and health and mental health and, you know, the gradual slow decline. And so, yeah, it was, it was just, it was just terrible. Um, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry, man. I, I apologize. I didn't realize that. Yeah, no, no worries. It is, you know, the, the uh, m most families that go through something like this, they don't have, it just happens and they have no, they don't know why, you know, we, we, we watched it happen. Like we did, like we were like, Oh my God, like we got to stop this. And so, you know, it's, it's super hard for the loss, but I told Perry, Perry like this, you know, there's only one end to this. Like, literally there's only one end. You can't just keep living like this, you know, an addiction and in illness, because there's only one end. So you, we have to, you know, you have to come home. Um, so we knew it was coming, but it's still, it's not, it's not any easier. Um, but maybe it's easier than people who didn't or couldn't understand what was happening and didn't know how to help or what to supply. We learned how to help by trying to help. Like literally, what do we do now? Oh man, let's go try that. <laughs> let's try this. And let's call that guy. I spoke to, you know, 40, you know, psychotherapist doctors and, you know, to try to get information. You know, that's how I learned about all of this stuff. That's how I ended up making the movie um, Bipolar Rock and Roller, because I gathered so much knowledge and information and had so many relationships. And then my client was bipolar. And I was like, well, let's use all this to help you. And let's figure out how we just keep moving this important information forward. Um, yeah. And the client that Frank is mentioning is Mauro Ranallo, correct? Yeah. 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 The um, bipolar rock and roller. The baby. bipolar <laughs> rock and roller. Yeah. I, so I've got to watch the movie. I, I, it's been on my thought to watch it. And some, I, Tim and I both commit this because we have our own issues. And that's the reason why we started this podcast. Uh, I am, uh, I received my peer support certification through New York State last year because I wanted to learn. And that's the way that I learned too, is by just throwing myself into it and taking in as much as I can. I I'm like, what is your view of the system? Like, where do you think we can start to help unravel some of the damage that's been done and actually push it forward? Because you're all about moving forward. Your Ted talk was all about moving forward and move forward. 
<laughs> and and I'm curious to I'm curious to get your opinion on how do we move forward? How do we move? How do we move parity forward? Like, how do we get all these things to work together? And is it possible? Yeah, it, it's definitely possible because we've made huge progress just in the past five, seven years in, in mental health awareness, um, social acceptance. And so that needle is moving, you know, very, very quickly. Um, so society is getting ready for sort of this big conversation, the, the real conversation. I don't think we know what to do about it. And I think all the systems are old and, <laughs> and, and half broken and they're going to, you know, we're going to have to rush and fix them anyway. So I don't think it's a systematic thing. Um, it's a social awareness. You know, we don't realize the stress of things and the effect of that. And we're now just getting, we're just like, oh my God, that's, you're right. Just like we suddenly woke up to CTE and, and head damage. So I was like, guys, you <laughs> like, what did you think was going to happen if we're like plowing each other in the brains? Um, that makes perfect common sense. And, and that's what we're running into now. So it, it's, it's a perfect time. I think it's a top-down thing. I think the celebrities, you know, the, the people that are leading social consciousness need to be the ones to weigh in on the conversation and drive it. And um, ironically, that's what our next project is, is we're doing a series called The Truth About Mental Illness. It's all celebrity driven. That's and awesome, man. We're touching on eight different mental illnesses because, you know, nobody wants to talk about the other stuff. Nobody no. wants to talk about bipolar. Nobody no. wanted me to make a movie about bipolar until it was made. And then everyone's like, oh, my God, this is exactly what is needed. You know, awareness, education, care. How do we deal with this? What do we do? You know, what are the effects? What are the ramifications if we do, if we don't? Like, you know, let's get real about this type of stuff. So that's our mm -hmm. next digital project after the film is the truth about series. And it's exactly what, well, and this is why you need to watch the film. Because Moro, you know, when I, I, I got NAMI, I got Fountain House, I got all these information leaders aboard and I sat them down and I said, I wanna make a film about mental health. And they're like, problem is it's not, it's not sexy. Like no one's into it. It's not cool. <laughs> we are, else. we're into it, we're into <laughs> it, we want it. That's why, that's why I'm here today because it, it, I had to literally sell the leaders of our <laughs> country's information on this on this idea, because they're like, listen, people aren't ready. And I was like, no, they're ready. And so the film sort of proved that. Like people really do want to be like, oh my gosh, I, that is my uncle, or that is my aunt, or oh my gosh, you're right. And or that is that, me. Or that me. is me. Yeah, and just have that awareness. And we've been shying away from the awareness for so long because of the stigma. And that's just old news, like, like, like head damage by the way if you ever get punched in the brain it hurts and damages your brain anytime regardless doesn't matter how you do it if you damage the brain or head in any way it shakes and damages your brain period you heard it you heard it first so cte is real and, there's and I, there's no fake I, news I, about it it's legitimate no, it's 100 percent real and how do i know this i talked to one of the leading neuroscientists in the world the same guy who filed the um uh, patent with the u.s government as cannabis as a neuroprotectant sat down with the guy i was like hey told him my theory about the my jello theory about the brain which is your brain, it's a bowl of jello. If you shake the jello, it breaks up and it separates. And that's how you get brain damage. So I tell him my theory. He goes, oh, it's worse than that. There's pokey points inside your brain. So every time you shake your brain, not only do you shake and break apart the jello, but you poke little holes in it. I was like, oh, that's not good. No, that's not good. Us headbangers, <laughs> us headbangers over here have been blasting our brain no back impact. for years. No man. No, <laughs> what the someone's, hell? Someone's got to monitor the speed of that headbang to make sure it's uh, not too aggressive. <laughs> that takes on the new uh, new new phrase of, of holiness, you know? Crazy, right? Yeah. I, yeah. But it made sense. I, I came up with all these theories to try to make fighting as simple and as functional as possible. And the jello theory was one, because I could see when the brain was shaken and when the spinal cord was impacted, what was happening. And it only made sense that every time that happens, what, where does the stress and impact go? You know, like it, it has to go somewhere. So and if it impacts your spinal cord, I'm assuming it's got to impact your nervous system. 
yeah, everything, like everything yeah. up there gets damaged. And here's the, the interesting part about that. Your brain feels no pain. So when I was coming up, everyone's like, yeah, don't worry about it. I was like, well, <laughs> I go, but I'm just, just, it just makes sense that we probably shouldn't, you know, smash that thing. And like, and people, because it didn't hurt, brain feels no pain. They'd be like, no, 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 we, we don't, we don't believe in that stuff. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I, I hope, I hope after people hear our conversation that they not only do a little research on the brain, but they, they do some research on you because what I noticed throughout all of your interviews and, and even your fights, like you are a, you are the perfect example of yin and yang because you are not your typical, what you would think of as a typical fighter. Because you've said over and over again that you didn't really want to fight, but you learned that you had to fight. And it's it's quite amazing that you had even that reflective ability after getting your head punched in for many times. Because, <laughs> because uh, again, you're going to take a lot of damage at some point. Have you had a lot of injuries yourself? Have you had any um spine injuries have you been repaired in places are you dealing with injuries is that what led you to cbd and stuff uh nope i literally wake up each day and it's as if it never happened wow it is the weirdest thing yeah i but uh everything i've rehabbed and cared for i broke my arm kung lee broke my arm and they plated it um yeah i saw that small small breaks like that i had a slap tear in my shoulder which they you know did the little three camera thingamajig um but nothing really serious and nothing that affects me now the only injury that i have that affects me now i had since i was younger and when i was 16 my right leg went numb when i was playing basketball in high school and they took me to the doctor and said oh you've broken your spine at some point and you need to have immediate spinal surgery and you're never going to play contact sports. I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so, wow. so I still have that same injury. It's called a spondylitis. But basically one of my little arms stacked up on my spine broke off my L3. And I think it was when I was about eight and I was on the second story roof and I fell off of it. Good I, Lord. Oh my yeah, God. I, Good Lord. You fall off I, of it. <laughs> like... <laughs> All the yeah, abuse I, you would stood. I, and you I, didn't, I know, yeah. man. But I couldn't you, tell anybody because I wasn't supposed to be up there and I would have gotten serious trouble. So I, I remember just laying in the yard and going like, oh, the pain will pass. So I think that's when it happened. It also happens in about 5% of people genetically at birth. So it could be anything, but it causes an imbalance and in uh, um, a lack of structure of my spine. So I do like have to maintenance it every day and stretch and kind of keep up with it. But literally, I wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh, my God, it could have been a dream. It's the weirdest, weirdest thing. Wow. Yeah. That is weird, man. How do you I got to ask, how do you stay so positive And so your your mindset is just so fixed on growth. How did how, like of everything that's happened to you? Again, I know that you could have gone a different path. And, you know, most people, I think feel like would have resentment or anger or, or, you know, play the victim, uh, you know, you just have this drive and this positivity that it like, I can like feel it through the phone. It's just amazing. How but, do you, you do? Know, how does, how is that? <laughs> I, I, I did feel those things and I didn't really know what to do about it. So I did what felt natural. Like I felt really bad about stealing all that stuff and being a total criminal. Like I really genuinely, afterwards I was like, oh man, like what's wrong with me? Like, what was I doing? <laughs> I was just going around robbing people. Like that was terrible. And I felt really bad about it. Like as a human being, cause it was a bad thing to do. And, and in my opinion, you know, I did a lot of time out of prison for almost three years. You know, I, I deserved way more. I truly did. I was a bad person. So when I got out, I was like, oh man, how do I deal with this fact that I really did do all this bad stuff? And the only thing I knew was to give back and to try to rebalance what I'd done. And to talk about yin and yang, I went back to the juvenile halls and said, hey guys, this is what happened. <laughs> and this is the result. And look, I'll just tell you exactly what happened to me. So I created a cycle where I could kind of heal from those, those feelings. And now I don't, like, I don't feel that way anymore. You know, I also don't look at something and think, hmm, I wonder if I can fit that in my car and steal it. But that's how I used to think when I was a kid, you know, because that's how I was wired. 
and I've slowly rewired myself with these different actions and with these different, you know, social things. And I, I don't feel bad about being a criminal now. I just feel stupid. I was like, oh, that was really stupid. <laughs> and the only good thing is I made a total commitment. Like I was a thousand percent convinced. I did a, a, a speech the other day and they're like, what's one of the things you truly believed as a youth that you've realized is false. And I was like, I could, I would have bet you a million dollars that crime was the tool. <laughs> I would have been like, no, I, a hundred percent it's working. And wow. until it wasn't. like, I, cause it, it worked, like it worked perfectly. It solved every problem that I had. And, you know, I see now, like if, you know, cause I go to all these different remote Indian reservations, I go to all these different communities where they don't have resources and they have terrible weather and they have real seasons. Um, you know, I was blessed to have all that happen to me in California. Cause if I was running away and trying to live on the streets in Natuishish or, you know, Newfoundland, I'd have died. Cause that's how the kids die up there. But, Got you know, it. because of location, because of resources, because of, you know, opportunity, it was a or, great experience. It worked or, or, or lack of opportunity in reality. Cause that's really what yeah. a lot of that is, is lack of opportunity. Yeah. True. Yeah. Wow. And I, do, I didn't, I didn't know anything. That's the other thing. I didn't know anything except for how to be a criminal and how to manipulate and lie and how to survive on the streets. And tell that's how you prison. survive. Right. I mean, yeah. That's how you survive. That's how you learn to yes. survive. And it yeah. felt comfortable. It so felt, I, it, I get it. Yeah. It worked great. Yeah. I and mean, then when I was in prison, I went to college and that's when I was like, Oh, I need to really learn stuff. And that changed everything. Thank that's, you for what you do. Thank you for the, 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 the mental health, you know, the film that you're talking about releasing and stuff like that. That's, that's awesome stuff. So just, I just want, before I forget, just thank you for what you do. Yeah, for sure. And you guys got to watch the uh, Bipolar Rock and Roller. You can uh, watch it at BipolarMovie.org. Um, well, I will be doing that as soon as we get off this call because I have yeah. some time to myself for the oh. next days because I'm in quarantine. So, Oh, I love good. it. Okay. It's all good. Well, so, yeah, um, I'm in quarantine. <laughs> um, I do want to add, I wanted to touch base on Fountain House because Fountain House is located in New York City. Yep. And we are in the Albany, the 518 area, which is where we were fortunate enough to meet Frank at the 2019 National Alliance of Mental Illness Education Conference. And Matt Shapiro introduced me. And Matt says hi to you, by the way. Um, and I'm curious to know. What, how did you get involved with Fountain House and what is, and obviously they're involved in your new film in some way. So can you explain that relationship a little bit to people in case people are hearing us down towards the city a little bit? Well, for sure. Yeah. For Fountain House, I work as an ambassador, meaning I, you know, just help and educate and um, support them. Um, you know, what they have, whether people are familiar with it or not is they really have the best community care and sort of social care for the severely mentally ill. And, you know, what happened in my life was I went looking for that information from my brother, Perry, and I it was recommended to go talk to these guys. And then I saw it in person. I was like, wow, this is next level. And this is really what we need, you know, socially to help maximize these people, you know, for where they're at. Um, and so that's how I got connected with Fountain House. We donate a portion of all of our um, mental health digital assets to them. And so that's how we support them as a, as a sponsor. And then, um, you know, I've been lucky to been able to advise them a little bit on how to brand and grow sort of this knowledge that they have, because it's extraordinary knowledge. Like it took me years and years to figure it out, <laughs> you know, just running around, like trying to you know, write it down in books. And these guys got it all figured out. And so I was able to help guide them to how to share that more globally and both gain the recognition and then the knowledge and data that comes back from different communities doing the services and um, working the programs and seeing the results. Because, you know, different cultures, different communities, they function differently. So until we understand how things work in different cultures, we don't know how to speak to them and address their mental health needs. So um, to me, that was a cool position to be a brain advisor on and try to help them, you know, think globally because everyone's taking their knowledge and using it, 
but they're not getting any recognition and there's no data coming back. And I was like, no, 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 we can't, we need data. That's how we figured, you know, that's how we figured out globally. Yeah, zeros and ones, actually. You need yes. zeros and ones to be able to figure it out, man. And it, see, the funny thing is, is that I, my brain, because of my upbringing, I was more of the creative type because mm. fantasy was easier to deal with than reality. My yeah. reality for my feelings and my emotions were very, was very tough. And you need to have facts and, and numbers to, to prove that what you're doing is, is working. And I, I commend you so much for for everything that you do, man. I, it's, it's, it's been a pleasure of Tim's and mine. And I can, I think I can say this for Tim that we've been able to talk to some really cool people and the knowledge that we're gaining is amazing. And we're happy to be able to share all these stories of people, because like you said, we are getting to a point now where mental health is, is, is in the spotlight a lot more, thank goodness. So I got a question for you because you are going to be using celebrities. So you don't have a problem with celebrities using their celebrity to be on a soapbox like other people do. I've heard a lot of like a lot of people get all pissed off about, you know, athletes talking about social issues. And I think a lot of it is because these people don't want to face that their social issues outside of their own scope. So, <laughs> so and, yeah. and, 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 and cultural competence is very important because we aren't, you know, we aren't all from the same background. We're not all the same thing. Um, how do, how do you feel about that? Obviously, I think I know your opinion about that, but I might be wrong about that. So I'm just curious to know how you feel about celebrity using their celebrity to, 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 to put out messages. Well, I, I to me, the, the, being a celebrity is just having value in a platform somewhere. So that's it. And you can use it for whatever you want. You know, as an athlete, my responsibility, I believed was to present and and promote a certain way because I believed in sports and in that type of presentation that that was what was most valuable. So for my role, that's what I did. Had a PG-13 brand, did my thing. <laughs> but, I, but I walked the line and I did as much as I could inside of that thing. So um, that was a very conscious decision. I was like, I'm never going to do anything that's not PG-13. So, oh wow! So you yeah. made, you really made that hundred percent. Yeah, the whole when I sat down at the very beginning and I was like, guys, I'm never going to do cigarettes, alcohol. Like that's never going to happen. I'm PG thirteen. I want my kids and I want martial arts kids to go. This is, you know, what I want to become. And so that was a conscious decision. I say that because a lot of people don't think like that. A lot of people aren't. They're just doing their thing and then they become famous and then they're like, oh, what do we do now? <laughs> um, I said that also because our society follows celebrities and believes in them and there's a huge value and it does, that doesn't exist the same in other societies, but in this society, that is the biggest thing. So I hundred percent believe that if they have the platform, they should use it, use it responsibly and use it for value. And those are the celebrities we're accessing because there are a lot of people like Moro, like myself, who've gone through something like you guys who've gone through something so powerful and we've all gone through it and nobody wants to talk about it. <laughs> right. Nobody wants to talk like, about it. We're like, we're like throwing notes over the fence. Like, hey, guys. And it doesn't make sense because if we just had the talk, it would all be OK. And I know this because after we made the film, you know, I love Morrow's one of my best friends, but he's bipolar to manage his life while he's a busy professional on camera and all these things is complete insanity because he's severely mentally ill. And it wasn't until we showed that in the film that people went, oh, well, that makes perfect sense now. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, we just thought this and we thought this and we thought that because of their perceptions. But the reality is gifted man got this ailment and this is how it rolls. And if we do these things, he's wonderful. Um, we just need those type of storytellings because here's the other thing, all my uber successful billionaire they're all, they're all have mental health issues because <laughs> nobody gets to that point without going crazy or driving themselves or, you know, whatever, uh, or being so driven or, you know, whatever. Um, and then, do you, think, and, do you think it's trying to make up for a lack that we feel within ourselves? It's so many things. It's, it's, it's trauma. It's biological. It's, it, it's social. It, 
we just had a pandemic. Like all the kids are traumatized. All the adults are traumatized. This is the first time in the world every human being is suffering from the exact same thing. Like this is a huge mental health, social, you know, moment. And we're all affected, whether we realize it or not. Most of us have no clue it's even happening that our mental health is being strained. <laughs> we're just falling around and trying to survive and, and, and doing these things. And then we don't know until we start having issues. We're like, oh, oh that, was, that, that felt weird. And what's going on over there? And that guy's an asshole. And you just start losing yeah. because your, your spirit, your inner, you, you've been affected. Everyone is affected right now. That's why, that's why it's time to do this series. Because people are now are open and ready. Before they weren't. They're like, ah, it's his problem. They're going through it, not me. Now everyone is going through it. And so now's the time to be like, all right, team, well, let's let's show you the truth. Like I'm super excited about showing schizophrenia. Because the people what people, when I say it, people go, Oh man, whoa. Like they have the same reaction to bipolar. You know, the bipolar five years ago. Now bipolar is like, oh, yeah, no, so-and-so's got, yeah, I know, I get it. And you got to do this and you got to do that. It makes sense. So I'm really interested in tackling those serious ailments where people just are so unaware that they just look away. And, you know, the thing with Moro and that film, and the reason why I want you to watch it and everyone to watch it is it's a wonderful, compelling story about a great person goes on this wonderful journey of success and failure and you know just a wonderful life journey and throughout it he has this ailment this illness and you know we we know where it comes from we know what happens and you get to see the result over 30 years and then you get to see the care modules for what's working now and how he's been able to take that whole thing and put machines in place so that he can keep functioning survive thrive be successful in his in his choices and that's that's some powerful stuff right there that's, that's, that's super powerful and that's what the series will be is adding those tools because what we the biggest feedback we got was people oh that's my aunt and we never knew how to do x or we never knew what the the y was it's like now we know the y we're going to go do this other one and you know to the point of the beginning of our conversation you know the information just doesn't exist out there in a real simple, cohesive, you know, you know, delivery. And I want to put those tools inside of a great entertainment and help move this thing. That's the mission. That is awesome. Wow. Perfect. Uh, what's the name me, of the, what's the name of the series going to be? The truth about mental illness. Okay. Wow. We're going to be looking for the truth about mental illness. <laughs> yes. Uh, to me, I want to be real cognizant of Frank's time. So I'm thinking um, if there's anything else you want to ask before we, before we uh, come to the lightning round, I think you'll like the lightning round. Maybe just uh, one, one quick thing, just cause we're about um, we're all about tools and tips here at above ground podcast. And we like to try and share what works for us and get people to share what works for them. That way there's more um, tools in the toolbox for people to choose, choose from. So what I know you, as being a speaker coach, um, you encourage others to be their best and you help them be their best. Um, what are some things that help you be your best? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, for me, uh, every day is sort of mind, body, spirit. Like I, I attack it that way. What am I doing for my mind? What am I doing for my body? What am I doing for my spirit? And that's it. when I wake up, I, wake up each day and I go, wow, thank God. That seemed like a dream. I can't believe it just happened. <laughs> and then I, I meditate or I pray and then I meditate and then I plan. And when I plan, I plan mind, body, spirit. Oh, what's my doing? When am I going to do something for my mind? I do this for my body. I'm going to do something for my spirit. And for whatever reason, when I make those focuses, when I make that the focus of my day, it just, all my days are wonderful. <laughs> and the things I plan to do are things that challenge me, things I like in business, things that I'm interested in learning, things, people I want to do business with, uh, people I want to see, you know, social things. Um, and that's what keeps me going. The pandemic was, was hard because I actually schedule those social things. Like I literally hang out because that's my time to hang out. 
And when I'm not, you know, head down or when I'm not, you know, super focused on doing these other things that give me passion or purpose. Or, so that was tough on me to not have that dedicated, focused, you know, social development exchange time. And, you know, thankfully for Zoom, we keep it going. But yeah, that, thank goodness. That, that was a change for me because I really like, I literally like, okay, from two to three, I'm going to go hang out and like have an intimate conversation with my buddy. Um, that was really valuable to me because it just makes me feel, makes my spirit feel amazing. Yeah. That connection, you know, raises yeah. your oxytocin levels and everything. Yeah, it feels, it feels fantastic, but I would, for sure for everybody, if you're not meditating and praying and you're missing out on most of your life, <laughs> because if, if you're not having that great contact, you know, with God and love and higher power, whatever, wherever you want to go, and then you're not defragging and, and focusing and calming this, you know, computer, then you just, you're not going to be able to, you know, do all the stuff you want to do. You just won't, you know, you're going to run around here trying to figure out some things. Um, but if you do those two items and it only takes 10 minutes, <laughs> it'll just change the whole energy of, of everything that you do. And, and that's where I, I make everybody start. <laughs> wow. Nice. Thank wow, you. That's, no, that's, that's great. That's great, yeah. man. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. To me, I, it's been such a pleasure talking to you, man. It's I thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you for being, like Timmy said, vulnerable and willing to share your journey with the world, because it takes a it takes a different person to be able to put all their all their cards on the table and and still be able to hold their head up high, man. And I, it's it's such a pleasure being able to speak to you, and I, I we very really value your time. So thank you very much for that. And if Timmy's got anything else to say, I'm going to let him kick off the first question too. Yeah. Just again, thanks. Thanks for what you do. And thanks for, you know, speaking up and um, thanks for, you know, giving us your time today for sure. Appreciate it. So uh, do you have a favorite or a least favorite word? Oh, a favorite word. Dang it. (laughs) My favorite word is fuck. All right. Yeah. All right. Not so PG 13, but that's good. Yeah. We like it. Cause that's my favorite word too. It's my it's favorite, so... it's, honestly, it's my, and I heard, I once heard a talk about it. Um, oh, I can't remember the guy, but it basically went like this. He's standing up there and he's like, if you're, hold on a second. I don't want to mess this up. Um, he's like, don't have a problem with words. And I was like, okay. Well, so it caught my ear. And he's like, it's a big, if, uh, and then he goes, fuck. I go, oh wow. <laughs> and because we're he's in a keynote setting. I'm like, whoa, I like this guy. Because he just said fuck and then said nothing else. I was like, wow. And you can see everyone's like getting uncomfortable and weird. And then he's like, um, if you got a problem with that word, then you got much bigger problems than the word fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And I was like, oh, I love this guy. <laughs> I love that word. That's my that favorite is- word. Uh, my least favorite word is no. Somehow I, I knew that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I gathered that from you saying that you've raised your hand enough to say yes. And that's really yeah. what it is. It's about answering the bell, right? Is that really what it's about? Answering yeah. the bell. Well, I don't like to hear no. I'll, I'll say no, but I don't like to hear okay. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, The second question is, what has been your biggest fight outside of the cage oh um hmm. oh that's interesting um you know i would say honestly the just it's it i have to i have to make an extra effort to maintain and nurture relationships because of the way i grew up i just i don't think about it and then all of a sudden it's months and months have gone by and the relationship has changed and they feel differently i'm like what do you mean what happened we were just right there um because in my brain, the ones and zeros line up and, and it doesn't make sense. So the hardest thing for me, and, and it became in retirement, I was like, oh, yeah, I got to hang out. Like, and it feels good when I do. <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's purposeful and, and everyone enjoys it. Um, so for me, because I'm wired, I just have to go, oh, yeah, get that on the calendar. Let's go have dinner. Let's hang out. And and then I leave and I'm like, ah, I'm so glad I did that. I feel amazing. <laughs> but I have to make an extra effort to do that. I, I notice that anybody who has sustained the trauma, 
And I, and yeah. I did not sustain the trauma that you sustained, obviously, but I, we're not here to compare it. But I do recognize, though, that it does take it does affect all your relationships. Yeah. And it, it affects every single one of them from personal to business to everything. It does affect everything. And I, it's I'm very, very happy that you said that. Thank you very much for sharing that, man. Yeah, for sure. And knowing that it affects me, I take a beat before all stuff. And I give it an extra thought and a, and a different and a sideways look because <laughs> I, I, I just sometimes I don't know because I feel a certain way. And then I go, oh, let me think about that, you know, because it takes a little bit longer for me to sometimes get to the the right emotion or the, you know, look at it correctly. Ones and zeros says this, but I always take another moment <laughs> to make sure that, you know, I'm feeling what the facts, you know, say. That is wow. definitely re- relatable. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I suppose if anybody needed a definition of emotional IQ, Frank <laughs> Frank Samrock has certainly got a freaking master degree in <laughs> IQ, emotional IQ for sure for that one. Wow. All right. So the last question is, if there was something that you could do or that you would like to see done for mental health as a whole without any kind of restraint, what would it be? Oh, wow. Um, hmm, man, for mental health. You know, I would just go back to after seeing what the Fountain House can do and seeing, you know, an impact and a community using its resources in the way it should. You know, that's what I'd love to see happen to mental health is to have a social awareness and understand that everyone's like, oh yeah, we need those places. And then to have those places (laughs) so that when, (laughs) you know, when Aunt Judy, you know, goes off the walls and, and we got to get her care and back in order, you know, that there's places and understanding that, Hey, Judy's off the walls. Like (laughs) let's go reel her back in and get her back plugged in again. Um, And it's just a mechanic of health, not a stigma. And so that, that's where I want to get, you know, that's my real mission here. There's a social, there's still a social stigma, you know, there's still a social stigma on fighting. People are like, Ooh, that, that doesn't look good. <laughs> Cause it's not, <laughs> it's, it's scary and it's dangerous and it's frightening. And unless you know about it or love it or, you know, believe in it or, uh, you know, it's, it's terrifying. And, and, and that's what's happened with mental health. And it's come from thousands and thousands of years of, you know, painting that person is crazy. And, you know, it's, it's not going to go away anytime soon, but it's ready to be, you know, shown the light on. And it's ready to people to be like, huh, you know what? You're right. <laughs> I feel that way too. Throw another note over the wall. There you go. Oh yeah. Here comes, <laughs> here comes, here comes. I got it. <laughs> You're wow. right. That's uh, very <laughs> Very well said. I, I agree with that. I think, um, you know, that the whole fear of the unknown and, you know, the lack of education that we have, it's, is, uh, it, yeah, it's definitely all that, all those, all those points put together. It's definitely pretty powerful for sure. Yeah. And we're getting there and you guys are helping like this is uh, guys, it takes, you know, two people to start and then three and then like literally, because one guy goes, ah, huh, you're right. That makes perfect sense. And yeah, that's my Aunt Judy. Um, you know, this information has just been so isolated for so long. And now it's coming out. And Good way. To, you know, yeah, that's a good yeah, way. The to, more to we can it. get it out, the more stuff like your show, the more knowledge, the more, you know, that's what people need is to go, ah, no, that makes, that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, Connection. Like, like getting punched in the head. It makes perfect sense. <laughs> That's probably bad for you. <laughs> yes. Chances yeah, are just like ignorance is bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, funny. Man. <laughs> Frank, thank you so much for taking your time, man, and 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 coming on with us. Uh, it has been so awesome being able to connect with you and 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 have you ta- tell us about all the things that you're working on. And I thank you. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, man, I'm filled with gratitude that that I even get the chance to sit in this conversation because these conversations mean a lot to me. Tim and I, I can I coined us the curators of hope because oh, I love it. Well, it's you know, we we both come through something and I yeah. felt that when I came through my own stuff that I had a mandate 
to help someone else. And, and that's why we started this. And, you know, when we came together to do this, we both had the same idea. So that's why, and I, I can't, can't thank you enough for, for sharing your, your, your world with us. I appreciate it very much. Yeah. Because that, you know, that, that obviously it helps, you know, especially on top of it is, is being, being a man, being this powerful image of a man that you are, and being open and being vulnerable and talking about these things. It's like, you, you don't hear of it in general, but to hear, you know, three guys, you know, waffle about it is a, is a pretty big deal. And, you know, and, and it helps, you know, having people like you come on here and share your story and share these other methods and, and what you're doing. It's just, just this conversation, you know what I mean? So, you know, like Will said, just very grateful. Thank you. Yeah, man. My pleasure. I appreciate you guys. Absolutely, Thank man. You. Thank you very much. So, wow. Will, what do you wow say, to man? me, oh, dude? I, I, it's, I know. I, I, I wanted to just leave it. I, the mic drop happened like five minutes ago. So <laughs> I kind of, I kind I'm kind of off there. So, but um, I can't. I like it's so awesome, and I'm so grateful that we've had the ability in in the the that the universe would put Frank and and people like Frank out there for us to be yes. able. To and, and, and be out there to be a voice and to be a face, because that's what I like to think of us as the face for the face, the face for the, for the faceless and the name for the nameless man and the voice for the voiceless. Yeah. And that's, that's what we love to do. So until next week, be well, be safe, be, be a a bo- bo-